Well, all right, welcome to those of you who are in the room and who are joining us online. Glad you guys are here. If you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it. Get to 2 Peter, the letter of 2 Peter. We'll be in 2 Peter chapter 1. As you're at, as you're at home, grab your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we will jump in. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. As you're turning there, in 2017, Nike released the off-white Air Jordan Chicago, which for the majority of you are like, I literally don't care. I just don't care. Uh, but they released a shoe in the spring of 2017, the off-white Air Jordan Chicago, and upon releasing, it sold for $190. For some of you, you're like, yeah, it's about what I spend on shoes normally. For others of you, you're like, that's about 19 times what I spend on shoes, my friend. So $190, it was what, it was, is what that was sold for upon release, spring of 2017. You can now get on the internet and find the off-white Air Jordan Chicago for selling for $2,000 plus. Nobody's buying shoes for $2,000 in this room, and if you do, you should come and talk to me. So you can find it for $2,000 plus on the internet these days. But, so here's what's unfortunately happened, just like it's happened with so many products. People have imitated the off-white Air Jordan Chicago and sold fakes on the internet for all kinds of money. And so now there are websites dedicated to helping you and I figure out what's the real and what's the fake. And so I figured it would be fun to play a little game with you guys. Uh, there's a photo that's going to come on the screen. These are three off-white Air Jordan Chicagos. One of them is the real thing. The other two are fake. And so just like if you were at the Astros game and they put that baseball under the, like, the Goya cans, you know? That's what we're about to do in here, except I'm not going to move the shoes. So I would like for you just to hold up your finger. You can do this at home with your family. Which one you think is real and which one, or not, no, just which one you think is real. So you go ahead, you make it, lock in your decision. You don't have even time to contemplate. Go with your gut. It's, it's probably wrong. Just go with your gut. You can select which one you think is real. All right, lock your answers in. You got it. Here we go. Okay, so from, uh, from, you're from left to right because that's how we read. It's one, two, three. The real one is, you've got your answer locked in? Number one. So for some of you, you just threw away $190 to $2,000 on a fake shoe. Some of you guessed right and you're like, thank God. That's just so great. Thank God. But what you did to get it right is you guessed, right? Unless, unless anybody in here is an Air Jordan expert, I'm assuming you just guessed and happened to get it right. And for those of you who held up two or three, I'm not blaming you. It looks the same. How would you know any different? And the truth is the only way that you would know the fake one is if you really knew the real one. And that's how these people on these websites do. You know what they do? They compare the fake to the actual thing. You and I, we cannot purposefully spot the real thing without the knowledge of the real thing. We have no ability to do that. Now, why do I tell you that? Because you and I are living in a current cultural moment where we are bombarded with information and opinion and things that are pitched as truth. And we as the people of Jesus have to have some kind of filter through which to shove all of that information to say, what is the truth and what is a lie? Because if you buy the lie, it's far more costly than you would ever know. And here's the deal. What we're gonna find from 2 Peter today is that you cannot discern the truth unless you know the truth, unless you know the truth. In fact, so we're going to start this series through Second Peter today called Discerning the Truth. And we're going to do just that by looking at the book of Second Peter, which is written to these people of Jesus that have been given this idea, given this message that the return of Jesus isn't actually going to happen. Jesus will not return in judgment as he said he would. Therefore, it doesn't really matter how you live. What's more, you know what you should pursue? You should pursue pleasure because pleasure is the highest good. This is the message that the people that Peter is writing to are receiving, and this is what Peter will respond to. How? By helping them filter that message through the truth of who God is and what God has said. 
Because you cannot discern the truth unless you know the truth. So if you've got your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 1, I would invite you to stand as we read together. We will read through the whole chapter, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 21. So hang with me at the end of our reading. We say this phrase, the very words, just as a means to differentiate God's perfect words from mine that are not. 2 Peter 1, starting in verse 1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks of these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not clever, follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy is ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You can have a seat. So this is the main idea I want us to get into our bones today. You cannot discern the truth without knowing the truth. You cannot discern the truth without knowing the truth. And what I want to do with this passage here in 2 Peter chapter 1 is actually give you the why and then give you the what. So I'm going to start in the back side of the passage in verse 16 that gives us the why, and then I'm going to apply that with the what. So here's the question that we'll ask. Why should we trust God's word? Why should we trust God's word? Quite simply, the answer is this, because it is the way in which we navigate the world we live in today. We trust God's word because it is the way, it is the only way in which we navigate the world that we live in today. Look at verse 16 with me. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says to them, look, when we told you about the power and the majesty of Jesus, we weren't just making up stories. We were there when it happened, verse 17, for he, when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the mountain. When Jesus was transfigured, me, James, John, we were on the mountain, and I was like, Elijah's here, Moses is here, Jesus is here, Jesus, we should stay here. This is incredible. Peter is saying, I was there when that happened, verse 19, and we have the prophetic word. Check it out. More fully confirmed. But Peter says to these people, we told you the story about Jesus' transfiguration because we were there. We saw it happen. And you know what we have? We have the prophetic word, what God has spoken. And that is more fully confirmed than me telling you that I was there on the mountain. This word is trustworthy. So, so how is it? How is it that we know? How do I know? that the word of God is the way, the only way that we navigate the world that we live in today? 
Because it's certain. Because it's certain. Look at verse 19 again. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. You've heard those words before. Psalm 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. It's the means by which I navigate the world that I live in. It helps me chart my course. And Peter is saying, it is the way that we navigate. Why? Because it is certain. Look back at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. How do I know that it's certain? Because number one, it is based off of eyewitness accounts. The words that you will read in the gospels are words given by eyewitnesses or through the story of other eyewitnesses. They saw and walked with, saw Jesus do all that Jesus did, saw him live, die, rise, ascend, saw the birth of the church, have written letters to the church. What you are reading is eyewitnesses witness accounts. It's not just something that I made up, wrote down, gave to you and said, you ought to read this. It's somebody who saw it happen. So we know that it's certain. What's more is that it's because it's certain. We know, we know that it's certain because of it's, it's based off of eyewitness accounts. And second, we know that it's certain because it is the very words of God. Look at verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is the deal. When you're reading Matthew or you're reading Paul or you're reading Jeremiah or you're reading Peter, you're not simply reading the words of Matthew or Paul or Jeremiah or Peter. You are reading the words of God via Matthew, via Paul, via Jeremiah, via Peter. That's, here's the word for that. It's called inspiration. And the word does not matter, but the definition does matter. B.B. Warfield says it like this. It will suffice to remind ourselves that inspiration looks upon the Bible as the word of God in such a sense that whatever it says, whatever the Bible says, God says. So what you are reading when you open the Bible and you read it, you are reading God's words primarily, not Peter's. When you are hearing the word of God spoken, you are hearing God's words primarily, not Matthew's, not Jeremiah's. These are God's words via men. He carried them along by the power of the spirit to pin down the things that you and I have today. We stand in honor of God's word and we say the very words, not just because it's cool and not just because it's unique and not just because it's a thing the Bay Area does. We do that because we legitimately believe God speaks. We ought to listen. So for those of you who have ever said in your life, man, I really just wish that God would speak to me. He has and does every time you open the scriptures. You want to hear God speak? Open your Bibles. Read them. And God speaks every single time. Because these are the very words of God. They're inspired by God. Men wrote them, carried along by the Holy Spirit. You hold in your hand the very words of God. So why do we trust the word of God? Because it's the way that we navigate the world that we live in. Why? Because it's based off of eyewitness accounts, and it is the very words of God. It's inspired by God. Okay, so if that's the case, how are we going to apply this then? Because I said, in order to discern the truth, we have to know the truth, okay? So we're gonna base this off the truth of the scriptures. It is our filter. We've understood this now. It's the thing by which we compare all messages. It's the truth. It's the real thing. It's the real Air Jordan that we say, which ones are the fakes? But what does that look like applied? Well, what does it look like for Peter? Look at verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Okay, so let's remember the message that the people of God are receiving who Peter is writing to are, hey, Jesus isn't going to return. 
That's the false teaching. He's not going to come back. He's not going to judge. It's not going to happen. So guess what? It doesn't really matter how you live. You live how you want to live. You pursue pleasure. You go get it. Whatever feels good, you chase it. It doesn't matter because you're not going to be judged. It's not going to happen. That's the messages they're receiving. That's what they're having to figure out. Okay, well, hold on. So Jesus hasn't returned. It's been some time since he's been here when he said he was going to turn. So, so maybe they're right. Like they're having to figure this out. They're having to filter this through the truth to figure out what is the truth. And Peter helps them by saying, look, in verse three and four, you've been given everything that you need by the divine power of God to live a godly life. He says, it does matter that you live a godly life. In the face of the false teachers, it does matter how you live. You've been given everything everything that you need by God's power. Why would God give you everything you need to live a godly life if it didn't matter how you lived? You see Peter filtering this through the truth of who God is and what God has said. So because God has given us all that we need, verse five, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the message of Peter in the face of the false teachers who say it doesn't matter how you live because Jesus won't come back and judge. Living a godly life does matter. You've been given everything you need to do it. So then what should we do, Peter? Make every effort to live a godly life. Pursue living a godly life. Work at living a godly life to which if you've been in church for any amount of time and you've even listened to me ever, you're thinking, hold on, man. You, I thought you said that salvation and life with God was by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. You have said that to me, Cade. You have said that I get into a relationship and stay in a relationship with Jesus by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. And that's right. I'm not going back on that today. We cease being Christian if there's any other way of getting a relationship with God. It is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But here's what happens. When we come into relationship by grace, that grace seeps into our soul and does something in us such that it causes us to go and be different, to use the language of Peter, to go and make every effort to live a godly life. Dallas Willard says it like this. Grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. Grace, you know, does not just have to do with the forgiveness of sins alone. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. That is your story and mine. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see Paul living in this tension. I've received the grace of God, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. Here's our story, friends. Follower of Jesus in ba- at Bay Area Church 2020, your story, my story is, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And from there we say, but that grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, it caused me to work harder than anybody. And check it out. Then he comes back. But it wasn't just me. It was the grace of God working in me. Because this is what the grace of God does. We receive the grace of God, free, unmerited grace. And it sinks into us and transforms us into different kinds of people with different desires and different pursuits and different works, and it causes us to pursue godliness. I've heard it said before, look, the the Christian life is not marked by perfection, but progress. Hear me say today, I'm not calling you to perfection. I'm calling you to pursue God progressively. Make 
every effort. This is what grace does. And not to unlike the message to the church in Second Peter, the message to the church today, perhaps we've got it twisted in the church in 2020, is we can use the grace of God as an excuse for living a godly life. Oh, well, God is gracious, and I'm not perfect, you know. So, I, I mean, I always get it wrong. So thank God that there is grace. So I'll just, I'll just lean on the grace of God. And what we do is we lean into the grace of God as an excuse for living a godly life. Am I thankful for grace? Am I thankful that God takes busted up, messed up, sinful people and makes them his own? Yes and amen. That will be my story until glory. However, we ought not find ourselves using the grace of God as an excuse for living a godly life. We ought to use the grace of God as the fuel by which we pursue a godly life. It is the thing that fuels our effort. Because we have received grace, it causes us to be different. Notice we're not earning, we're exercising effort. We're not trying to gain anything from God. But because we have already received it by his grace, it causes us to say, your way, not mine, your ways to life. I will pursue godly living at all cost because of the grace of God. Not because I'm trying to gain it, but because I already have it. Because I already have it. This is Peter applying the truth of God to the messages of the culture. And this is how we do it too. Because you cannot discern the truth if you don't know the truth. So ask yourself, what are the messages that you're hearing, seeing, experiencing today? And how does God's word address those messages? And let's just be honest. The message that you and I are receiving today is not so far off from the message of 2 Peter. Hey, you're not really going to get in trouble for this. You live your life. Perhaps you've heard it like this. You do you. Pursue pleasure. That's the highest good. Perhaps you've heard it like this. If it feels good, it must be good. Our world today is not so far off from the world of the scriptures to which we would do well to take those messages and filter them through the certain word of God because you can't discern the truth unless you know the truth. Take all of this out here, hold up the true thing and say, does it match? And if it doesn't, get rid of it. Don't listen. Click mute. Unfollow whatever analogy you need to escape that false teaching. You're in the midst of it, church. Perhaps now more than ever. You get on Facebook for four seconds and you have 4,000 different opinions that you've just scrolled through. Good, bad, and in between. And if you took every article that you read on Facebook as gospel, you were gonna find yourself in a chaotic space. Take those things and filter them through the certain words of God because you cannot discern the truth unless you know the truth. Okay, so then what's our action step? If the word of God is the filter through which we live our lives today, if it's certain, what's our action step? This is going to be novel. Our action step is this. We have to know, we have to read, and we have to memorize God's word. We have to. Look at verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter says to this church, I'm going to keep reminding you, and I'm going to keep reminding you, and I'm going to keep reminding you so that when I die, you can remind yourself. So friends, people of God at Bay Area, you need to read, know, and memorize the words of God because without that, you will not be able to call to mind the truth in order to discern the truth and you will buy a lie and it will cost you far more than you're willing to pay. So you have to read, you have to know, you have to memorize the words of God. You have to get it into your brains and sink it into your hearts such that when you are approached to buy whatever message, you can just regurgitate the truth of God's word in the face of whatever message you say and say, this is the truth. If you don't line up, then get away. We have to know We have to read. We have to memorize God's word. And so listen to me. 
if you're here today or you're watching online today and you don't own a Bible, don't feel ashamed by that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to email me, cade.pierce at bayarea.church, and I will get you a Bible. I will get you a Bible. If you're here today, And every time you approach the Bible, you think it's just hard. I don't understand, and I don't have handholds for it. I don't have questions to ask. I don't have ways to study it. I just need some help. I need somebody to help me know where to start, some things to ask as I approach it so that I can help uh, understand and apply God's word. If you need that, you email k.pierce at barry.church, and I want to have that conversation with you. And if you're here, and you won't even approach the Bible because you've got so many hangups around the Bible, you email me, k.pierceatbarry.church, and I want to have that conversation with you. And I'll tell you the story of when I was in that exact spot in college. Friends, I, I'm not asking you to read the Bible. We don't want you to read the Bible at Bay Area as pastors because we get a kickback for every human that reads their Bible every day. We don't get royalties if you read the scriptures. We want you to read the Bible because we are are certain there is no other way to faithfully navigate the world you're living in. There isn't. You'll buy a lie and it will destroy eventually. We have to know, we have to read, we have to memorize the words of God. You cannot discern the truth unless you know the truth. Let me pray for us. Father, we are really grateful that you have spoken and that by your speech, we can navigate life. It is the, it's the way that we navigate. It's the light, it's the lamp, it's the filter, it's the anchor, it is the all of the above. You have spoken and we want to listen because your word is certain. So help us, help us to be people who filter everything we hear, see, read through the truth of who you are and by what you have said, because what you have said is certain. So thank you for speaking. Thank you for revealing yourself. What a gift, God. We want to listen. We want to listen. We say all those things. In the strong name of Jesus, amen.